Greetings and welcome to the introduction to astronomy. In this lecture, we are going to continue talking about galaxies and specifically look at the properties and distances of galaxies. How do we measure those distances? So let's start out with some of the basic properties. So what about the mass of a galaxy? How do we determine the mass? So remember in astronomy, all we can do is look at an object. All we do is see its light and we have to be able to do use it to determine the mass using just the light. And that is done from Kepler's third law as modified by Isaac Newton, where we measure the rotation of the where we look at the rotation of objects in the galaxy. So we can look at two different things. We can either look at the rotation of objects such as stars in the galaxy, as we see here for a rotation curve for a spiral galaxy. Or we can look at the broadening of spectral lines which for an elliptical galaxy. Remember elliptical galaxies don't have quite the coherent rotation that a spiral galaxy does. When we measure these masses we have a problem. The problem is that there is far more mass in the galaxies than what we can see. And we've talked about dark matter before. This is where dark matter comes in. We expect based on what we see the curve to follow the lower line but it follows the upper line and increases meaning that there has to be a lot more mass out beyond the edge of the galaxy here there has to be a lot more mass all around it now when we look at galaxies we can look at the ranges and we find that elliptical galaxies have a big range in mass here are the ellipticals and they can go from 10 to the fifth solar masses, the smallest dwarf ellipticals, to 10 to the 13th, the giant ellipticals, much larger, 10 times larger than the largest spirals. So a big, big range here. Whereas the spirals and ellipticals and irregulars are a much narrower range. Diameters are the same. Big, big range in diameters, big range in luminosity. And we see that irregulars tend to be smaller than the spirals. So ellipticals and spirals are among the bigger two galaxies. Irregulars tend to be a little bit smaller in terms of the mass and the diameter. Now when we look at the stellar populations, again we looked at this previously, ellipticals are all old populations. They have no gas and dust. That's why they're old populations. They are not forming stars. And we will come back and look at mass to light ratios again in a second here. So what do we mean by a mass to light ratio? Well, we compare the mass of the object in solar masses to the luminosity of the object in solar luminosities. And we divide these two. And that gives us what we call the mass to light ratio. Let's look at an example for the sun. The sun has a mass of one solar mass and a luminosity of one solar luminosity. That's how those are defined. So one divided by one gives us one for the mass to light ratio of the sun. And anything else would then be compared to that. So something that gives off a lot more light with less mass would then have a much smaller mass to light ratio. It's giving a lot more luminosity. Something that has a lot of mass and is dark would give off a very, it would have a very high mass to light ratio. Now, how does this apply? Well, low mass stars contribute a lot of mass, but very little light. They may be low mass stars, but they give off very little light relative to their mass. So they have a large mass to light ratio. High mass stars give a lot of light relative to their mass and therefore have a small last to mass to light ratio. So that ratio is really just added up from all the objects that it is composed of. So very young galaxies with lots of very hot bright stars would have a low mass to light ratio maybe in the order of 1 to 10. An old galaxy without those hot young stars would have a mass to light ratio in the range of say 20 to 30. Now, how about dark matter? Well, these ratios apply to what we see in the inner parts of the galaxy. But most of that matter is invisible, invisible dark matter, stuff that we cannot see. It has a lot of mass and no light, meaning it is an extremely high mass to light ratio. 
all galaxies have some amount of dark matter. So we see some of these galaxies can have mass to light ratios in excess of 100. So they have a lot more mass as compared to the amount of light that they give off. And understanding this dark matter is going to be very important for understanding galaxies and the universe. Now, how about distances? How do we determine distances? Well, distances are very difficult. How do we figure out the distance to a galaxy? Well, what we can do is we need to get these accurate. So how can we do this? We cannot use parallax. So no parallax for galaxies. Only the closest galaxies can we resolve the individual stars. So things like variable stars and Cepheids do work, but only for the nearest galaxies. This is how we determined that Andromeda was actually another galaxy. So if we determine a, find a Cepheid, the period luminosity relationship can be used to give us the distance then. But you have to be able to resolve those stars and you can't see them once you get outside the local neighborhood of galaxies. So we have to use other things. Uh, some things we use are what we call standard bulbs or candles. So something that is a standard brightness, a standard bulb is an object with the same luminosity so that any differences in the apparent brightness only depend on the distance. They're all just as bright. So if something is very faint, it must be further away. If it's very bright, it must be close. So we know once the object is identified, we know the luminosity. We've got that and we measure the apparent brightness, which means we can then determine the distance to these. Now, one of the most prominent standard bulbs that we use are the type 1A supernovae. These are a good standard bulb. Why? If you recall, a type 1A supernova are all made from the same ob type of object, a 1.4 mass solar, a 1.4 solar mass white dwarf star in a binary system. They're all exactly the same objects that explode. They should theoretically reach the same peak luminosity, meaning that when we see something like a supernova go off in one of these galaxies as we see here in images taken in March and then in July of 2012 from this small distant galaxy we can detect them we can then determine we know it's a type 1 we identify it as a type 1 supernova so we know its peak brightness in luminosity we measure its peak brightness in apparent uh, luminosity and therefore we can get the distance to this star uh, to the galaxy to the star which gives us the distance to the galaxy that contains it this works out to 8 billion light years that's a good fraction out toward the edge of the universe considering the universe is about 13 to 14 billion light years outward so this is very important for determining distances and understanding the evolution of the universe. Now let's look at some other methods that are used to determine distances. For disk galaxies, we use the Tully-Fisher relationship, which says that the luminosity of a spiral galaxy is related to its rotation rate. More luminous spiral will spin faster. So we can measure this rotation speed through the 21 centimeter hydrogen line. Use this to determine the luminosity from our chart. So we measure the we measure the rotation and then we can determine from that what the magnitude would be. So we can then determine that magnitude brightness uh, of luminosity. Once we know a luminosity then we can we can see it then we can determine its apparent and its absolute magnitudes and that gives us the distance however it is limited to spiral galaxies so we cannot use this method for ellipticals now let's look at our distance ladder overall and we're not quite done with this yet we still have one more method to go but different methods will work to various distances and we need remember that we need to use one method to calibrate the others and those errors build as we move out. So we can use things like Cepheid variables for certain galaxies out to about 100 million light years.
the Tully Fisher relationship to 300 million light years. This type one supernovae getting much further out and then finally Hubble's law, which we will talk about later, out to the edge of the universe. As long as we are able to view that galaxy, we can then determine its distance. And remember that this builds on things, the Cepheid variables builds on things that we looked at previously with spectroscopic parallax and with parallax itself as other ways of determining those distances. So each one builds on our knowledge from the previous uh, measurements. So let's go ahead and finish up here with our summary. And what we've looked at is that masses of galaxies can be determined using Kepler's third law as modified by Newton. We looked at the mass to light ratio as a way of comparing the amount of mass an object campaign contains to the amount of light it emits. For the sun, this is one. And we looked at some of the ways of determining distances to galaxies using Cepheid variables or for more distant galaxies, type 1a supernovae. So that concludes this lecture on galaxies, properties, and distances. We'll be back again next time for another topic in astronomy. So until then, have a great day, everyone, and I will see you in class.